Hey there, everybody. Um, welcome back. We are uh, looking at the fifth set of notes for the electrostatics unit. And um, today we're going to talk about something called uniform fields. So everything we've talked about so far involves point charges, like a little proton that is like a little point in space that might be surrounded by an electric field. Um, and the thing about those char uh, those um, fields is that they're all non-uniform. What I mean by that is if I have a little positive charge here, I know the field's going to kind of look like this surrounding it, but that um, that charge is going to create a field which is non-uniform that varies in both magnitude and direction. So depending on how close you are, it's going to get stronger or weaker, but also depending on where you are in that field, it might be pointing up or left or right or down. And so, um, so that's a, a non-uniform field. And so we've seen that many times. An example of this might be a little charge like this. I've got my little positive charge and it's surrounded by a, uh, a non-uniform field. We can see it getting weaker as it goes. But what I want you to think about is imagine a situation, imagine I could take um, a positive charge and line up a negative charge kind of opposite it, like this. And then imagine that I, I line up some more positive charges and I start to line up more and more positive charges kind of all in a line, kind of like this. And they're evenly spaced out, a nice neat little line. And then over here, I, um, start, to I, I start to line up some negative charges. And these negative charges are all kind of nice and evenly spaced and they make a nice line kind of like this. And then what you might start to notice is that outside of that field, or sorry, outside of the, the, those two um, lines of charges, the field is still swirling around and getting weaker as you go. But inside this field, uh, these two lines, you can see that in the middle here, the field is all kind of pointing in the same direction, like it's always pointing down in this case. And it turns out that not only would the um, direction of the field be constant, pointing down, but so would the magnitude, the strength of the field in between these two lines of charges would also uh, would also be basically constant wherever you look. Now, um, you might say to yourself, okay, great, but when would that ever happen? Uh, an example of where we could make that happen is if, suppose I had two metal plates like we see here, and these metal plates, I could move them closer or further apart, and I could make them all different sizes and what have you. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect those plates to a battery. So imagine this is like a 1.5, five volt battery and here's my positive end and here's my negative end um, these plates aren't touching so it's not going to create a complete circuit if I connect it to the battery what is going to happen is when I connect this electrons are going to run out of the battery here and when they run out of the battery they're going to get to this plate and they're gonna spread out all over the, the plate. Now they're not gonna keep on flowing because once the electrons build up, no more electrons would come out. But as a result of the electrons building up on this plate, it would force the elect some of the extra electrons on the top plate to move out of the way. And so some of these electrons would actually work their way back to the battery. And what would we have as an overall result? Well, we'd have an overall negatively charged bottom plate and then positively charged top plate. And you can see that in between them here, we've got this electric field that would exist in between these two plates. And the strength of that field is gonna depend on a bunch of factors. But one thing you might notice is, look what happens when these plates get further or closer together. As they get further apart, those field lines spread out. And so the strength of that field gets weaker. If we make them really close together, then that field can actually be quite strong. By the same token, if I go over here to the battery, if I reduce this battery, so instead of a one and a half volt battery, it's only maybe a half a volt battery, we can see here that the field lines get much, much thinner. And so it's gonna be weaker. So this is an example of a a uniform electric field. And what we mean by that is that both the magnitude and the direction are uh, constant. So uniform or constant. And so if we have kind of as our example here, these two, these two metal plates here, and I'm going to attach these to a battery. Okay, so I'm going to plug in a little battery. Remember, that's the positive end and that's the negative end of that battery. So this plate would kind of become positively charged and this plate would be negatively charged and so as a result I would have a field and field lines go from positive to negative so I'd have a uniform field that kind of looks like this and so remember of course that field is only uniform kind of between the plates outside of the plates it's a different story now in a uniform electric field you can't use this formula 
E equals KQ over R. That's a big no-no. And the reason is because that only works for point charges. How do we know? Well, Q is a point charge. It literally is what Q means. But also R. Remember, R is a separation, how far you are from a point charge. It's not, for example, how far apart the plates are. So that's not going to work. We're going to have to come up with something different. But um, something for you to think about when you think about these uniform fields, you actually already have a bunch of practice with uniform fields. If you think back to when you first learned about gravitational fields, for a long time we talked about gravitational fields as though they were constant. So the gravitational field in this room, for example, has a pretty much constant value of about 9.8 newtons per kilogram. No matter if I go to the ceiling or to the floor, it's going to stay about the same. And so you could imagine, for example, a box sitting in a uniform gravitational field. And this gravitational field would be kind of pulling downwards. So my field is pulling like this. We never really bothered going into this kind of detail, but maybe useful to think about. Now what's going to happen if this box is allowed to fall from an area of high gravitational potential to low gravitational potential? I'm going to get a change in potential energy as I fall. And that change in potential energy is going to be negative. So as I fall from high to low, from a high to low uh, area of potential, I'm going to lose potential energy. And in the process, that potential energy that I lose would just turn into kinetic energy, which is really just an overly complicated way of saying that things will fall. Uh, if you're in a gravitational field. But the thing to keep in mind is, since this field is uniform, it becomes a lot simpler to talk about the energy change and to talk about the acceleration, for example. And so we'll see the same thing if we talk about um, electric fields. And so imagine in this case, I've got an electric field where here's my positive plate and here's my negative. And so I've got a field that's going to run from positive to negative. And so if this object here is a positive charge, then it will want to move from an area of high potential to low potential. And in the process, it's going to move from high to low potential. And in the process, it's going to lose potential energy. And so if you wanted to reverse that process, if you wanted to take this this object, this proton say, and you wanted to bring it back up to the top plate, you could do that, but it would take work. And the only thing to keep in mind with all this, of course, is that with charges, we've got the other side of the coin. With gravity, things were always falling down. But if you had, for example, a negative charge, like if I had an electron over here, then this electron would spontaneously fall the other way. It would spontaneously fall up, if you will, kind of like a negative gravity situation. So we can calculate the work that's being done in either case. Work is just a change in potential energy, and a change in potential energy is really just a change in potential times the charge. So this is a lot like lifting an object. The heavier it is, the harder it is to lift, and the more you change its potential, the more energy that's going to take. So um, <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, uh, one more formula here. So let's look at the strength of that electric field. As we saw in the animation there, the closer the plates are together, the stronger the field seemed to get, and the further apart they were, the weaker the field got. And the other thing that seemed to affect how strong the field was, was the potential difference between the two plates. So if you plug it into a stronger battery with a bigger potential difference, then you're gonna get a stronger field. And so it turns out that the strength of the field is really just equal to the, um, the uh, potential difference between the two plates divided by the distance apart, where E is the um, electric field strength, and then delta V is the potential difference. And D is the separation of the plates. Okay. Now, um, sometimes you'll see this formula written kind of with these lines beside it. And all those are really saying is they're talking about um, absolute value. Because keep in mind, delta V is a scalar, but E is a vector. And so when we kind of 
try and figure out the direction of the field, this formula is not going to help us do that. It'll tell us how strong the field is, but it's not going to tell us which way it's going to go. So you might see it written that way, and really it's just saying that it's just giving us a magnitude. So calculate the potential, <clears throat> sorry, the electric field strength between two parallel plates that are uh, 6 times 10 to the negative 2 meters apart. The potential of the top plate is 6 volts, and the potential of the bottom plate is negative 6 volts. So I've got two plates here. This plate here is at 6 volts, and this plate is at negative 6 volts. And they are separated by um, 0 0.06 meters. So the electric field is going to be the potential difference divided by the distance apart. Now the potential difference between a 6 volt and a negative 6 volt plate going from one to the other, doesn't matter which way you go, doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, but you can see that the difference between those two things is going to be 12 volts. I'm not going to put in negative 12 because I don't know if I'm going up or down or whatever. I'm just looking at the difference between the two. And then the dis distance between them is 0 0.06. And so the um, strength of the field is uh, 200. Now let's stop for a second and think about the units. When I look at this here, I've got volts, 12 volts divided by 0 0.06 meters. So the units here could be volts per meter. And that would be correct. Volts per meter is a unit of field strength. You might remember though, from talking about fields before, that we said that fields were newtons per coulomb. And that is also true. It turns out a voltmeter is the same as a newton per coulomb. And if you want to prove it to yourself, you're welcome to, and I'm not going to do it right now. So one more thing to think about with these plates is when we talk about potential difference, what we're talking about is the, the relative difference between the two. So in this case, it was a positive six volt plate on the top and a negative six volt plate on the bottom. That would have been the exact same thing if the top plate had been 12 volts and the bottom plate had been zero volts. That's it. Those two fields would be identical. I mean, if the top plate was 112 volts and the bottom plate was 100 volts, that's still a difference of 12. So the absolute voltage doesn't matter. What really matters is the the potential difference. So let's look at one last example here. So what we've got is we've got two parallel charged plates and we're going to start off with a proton close to the positive plate. Now of course when we release that, that proton is going to want to move. And so because the um, field, this is our positive plate and there's our negative plate, fields go from positive to negative so I've got a field like this, and a proton, a positive charge, would want to move in the direction of the field. So what this really is, is this is just like a really, really, really simple particle accelerator. This might be a way to get a proton going really fast. And you can see here, we've actually designed it so that there's a little hole in the opposite plate. So what's going to happen is this is going to accelerate, it's going to go flying along, and then if we hit it just right, it might go through that hole and then just zoom off, and then we've made a particle accelerator. So the magnitude of the field is going to be delta V over D. And the potential difference between these two plates, I can see I go from 400 to negative 400, that's a potential difference of 800 volts. And the distance between them is 0 0.025 meters. So the strength of this field is going to be 32,000 uh, volts per meter. And it wants me to specify the direction, so I'll specify that the direction in this case is is to the right. You'll note that I didn't figure that out from the equation, I just figured it out from looking at the picture. And then it asks, what's the magnitude of the electrostatic force acting on the proton? Now, it would be really tempting for us to say, no worries, I can do this. Force is just K times Q1 times Q2 over R squared. But I want to point out that this also will not work in this case. That formula is great for point charges. And hopefully you are starting to see a bit of a pattern of when we have these KQ or KQQ formulas, the Qs refer to point charges. So I've got a proton, that's a point charge, but the other thing in this equation is plates. Those aren't point charges, so that's not really gonna make sense. The good news actually is that I can use a much simpler formula, which was that electrostatic force is just field times charge. And I know the strength of the field, which is 32,000 um, newtons per coulomb. If I multiply it by the charge of one proton, 1 1.6 times negative 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, then I'll get the uh, force, which is 5.1, 5.12 times 10 to the negative 15 newtons. And there is my answer.
So this, uh, this proton is going to get um, pushed by this force to the right. It's going to be accelerated to the right. It's going to have work done on it in the process. And the final question here is, what is the velocity of the proton when it exits that negative 400 volt plate? Well, there's actually a few different ways to do this. And you could do it with forces and acceleration and kinematics, but that sounds like more work than I think it needs to be. And so instead, I'm going to say, look, um, what's going to happen here is it is going to change its potential energy. The potential energy of the proton is going to change because it's going to be accelerated through a potential. And so the change in potential energy is going to be the uh, potential difference times the charge. And so we can see here that we go through a certain potential difference and we, we have a, a certain value for our charge. Now, I know before when I went up here, I didn't bother with the sign on the um, potential difference because that was telling me just the amount of field strength. But in this case, this proton is actually starting here and it's actually going to there. So this proton is actually moving through this space. So the potential difference that the proton moves through will either be positive or negative. And you can see that the proton starts at plus 400 and ends up at negative 400. And so the change in the potential difference for this proton, for its path, is negative 800 because it's losing 800 volts of potential. I'm gonna multiply it by the charge of a proton, which is positive, and then my total change in potential energy is gonna come out as negative 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16 joules. Now, what does that mean that my potential energy is negative? Well, that kind of makes sense because that proton lost a bunch of potential energy because it was gaining a bunch of kinetic energy as it flew through that potential. And so I know that my change in kinetic energy is just equal to a negative change in potential energy. So if I lost all that kinetic energy, then I must have gained the exact same amount. Uh, sorry, if I lost all that potential energy, I must have gained that exact same amount of kinetic energy. So my change in kinetic is positive 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16. Now, um, the, uh, the change in kinetic energy is equal to the final minus the initial. Now in this case, the initial kinetic energy is zero because the particle was at rest when it first started to accelerate. So long story short, I can calculate my kinetic energy equal to one half mv squared, where um, v would equal the square root of two ek over m, and I can substitute in all my values and solve. So square root of two times 1.28 times 10 to the negative uh, 16 joules divided by the mass of a proton, which is on your data sheet, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And we come up with a final speed of 3.9 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Okay, so that is it for uniform fields.